We're very pleased to have uh, Chris Mancher and Courtney Ross from Canola Council of Canada join us this morning to update us on uh, Manitoba's most wanted troublesome pests. So Chris Mancher is uh, an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada covering the eastern half of Manitoba. While providing agronomic advice and support to growers and agronomists, he also provides leadership and industry coordination on sclerotinia. Chris is the research lead for the crop production and innovation team, helping administer the canola agronomic research program and the canola agri-science cluster, two of our major research funding programs. He received his bachelor's degree in plant biotechnology and master's in biological sciences, researching RNA-based next-generation pesticides at the U of M, University of Manitoba. Courtney Ross has uh, been an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada since May 2022. She covers the southwestern half of Manitoba and the southeast corner of Saskatchewan. Courtney is the Canola Council's lead for verticillium stripe, as well as canola storage and extension events. She received her Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, majoring in agronomy from the U University of Manitoba in 2019, and has been working in the industry since. So Chris and Courtney, I'll invite you up here, uh, and they'll be highlighting the top pests and pathogens that are most wanted here in Manitoba, and what strategies can be taken to manage them effectively in future growing seasons. Please help me welcome Chris and Courtney. Mm. Okay, thank you very much everyone, and thank you for the Manitoba Canola Growers for having this canola morning uh, session here. It's great to be able to talk a little bit on Manitoba's Most Wanted. And also thank you to all for coming today, especially through all these really blustery, windy conditions for that. And I kept on thinking to myself, I'm so glad that we don't have hurricanes or alligators or insects here in winter, but when it comes to canola, we still have to be kind of concerned about some insects, and we might as well throw some pathogens into that. So today what we're going to be talking about is some of these key yield robbers for canola, especially here in Manitoba. Uh, we're going to be touching on, I guess, four, four of the big top ones that we kind of want to really communicate some of the best, uh, best management practices for that, control strategies, and things that you should be on the lookout for, uh, especially in this upcoming growing season 2024 whatever kind of growing conditions we may have, drought or moisture or whatever happens. So, but before we kick off, just want to introduce you to our agronomy team that covers all of the uh, prairies here. So there's about nine of us agronomy specialists, so that's myself and Courtney here taking a look in Manitoba. And we're kind of at that intersection between research, industry, and essentially the whole uh, canola value chain. But primarily we do work with a lot of growers and agronomists providing, you know, kind of things that we're talking about here today. And that includes specializations such as myself in sclerotinia and then Courtney also in verticillium stripe. So if you have any questions, whether it's on a regional basis or on a uh, special pathogen or pest or other management technique, just let us know and we can definitely point you in the right direction. So back in 2022, we went and had a survey of growers and agronomists and one of the questions that we asked was, what do growers feel are pests of greatest economic risk? And so they went and had a whole list of them, and they ranked their top three. And no surprise, here in Manitoba, flea beetles was number one by a fairly wide margin. And compared to the 2022 results to 2020, uh, it even bumped up to 4%. So we continue to see that there's going to be a growing concern for that. Right there in second place, we got sclerotinia stem rot. It has dropped 10% from 2020, which makes sense because we're kind of in a dry bias over these past recent years. We have black plague, herbicide-resistant weeds. And then just want to make special note here, verticillium stripe, we're already at 24%. And this was back in 2022 as well, I think in the fall of 22. But it jumped up 15% from 2020. So we continue to see that this pathogen is going to be a key concern for us as these years kind of go on and we start seeing it become more prevalent across our fields, uh, potentially severity increasing, and then also what the implications are for yield. And then all we have the other mentions, club root, birth armyworm, volunteer canola, and there's others. But first, we need to address that uh, public enemy number one right here, and that's flea beetles. And so this is probably something that's probably gonna be on most people's minds. Yes, it causes yield losses there, it may, cause everyone to go and reseed if there's severe damage or trying to save your crop with multiple insecticide applications. 
But overall, there's just a lot of stress. And whether that's to the plant, you know, in that very vulnerable stage of that cotyledon to four leaf, or even on growers and agronomists having to go out and uh, scout for this almost on a daily or twice daily basis. So being able to figure out ways that we can actually manage this effectively, lower that stress for everyone, and ensure that those plants can actually get to that kind of critical stage where we're not sacrificing any yield. This photo I saw on Twitter, what was it, this over, over this past growing season, and this is from a uh, lab in University of Alberta. And these are these sticky traps that you can put out into your fields, and they had this on the edge of a field, and that's all crucifer flea beetles. And this is a very, very intense example of what kind of flea, flea beetle pressure we're actually going to have. Uh, hopefully you guys don't see this, but there is probably going to be some places where we're going to actually have this high flea beetle pressure. So how do we prepare ourselves for that? especially when we don't really have any um, prediction or any models to actually support whether they're going to be in, you know, in this part of the province or is it going to be in this field close to these shelter belts. We really don't have that information yet. But we can go and control things that are actually within our power to do so. And some of those things that I'll be touching on is adjusting your seeding practices, uh, potentially using seed treatments, and then those foliar insecticides. So these are, if you were in a nutshell, these are the three things you really want to key on. Now, before we even get to any of that uh, chemical talk, right, which is very, very good and effective, um, let's think about a little bit before that. And you know, when we're talking about growing canola, one of the first and most important steps is that seeding. And when it comes to flea beetles, it really is a numbers game, right? You want to win that battle with your canola plants versus the number of flea beetles. And so there was some recent research out of the University of Manitoba that was taking a look at what the impacts of plant stand has on your potential yield or your expected yield. And they had three different uh, plant stands, three plants per square foot, six plants, and 12 plants. And so while 12 plants is definitely on that very high side, we find that there really isn't any significant differences in yield for that. So when we take a look at you know, the past messaging, that five to seven, five to eight plants per square foot, we're essentially right on the money there uh, in terms of getting that you know, six plants per square foot, even if we have that flea beetle pressure. But once you drop to that very low kind of density, you know, that three plants per square foot, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get poor yields, but likely your odds are going to be uh, um, definitely less, less yield. And we see this in this uh, particular research study where, you know, they experience almost a 30% yield loss. So. so to summarize that up, we definitely want to target that plant stand of five to seven plants per square foot. So if you're going to be anticipating that there's going to be high flea beetle pressure potentially, or you want to hedge your bets against that, maybe up your seeding rate a little bit. Um, another thing is definitely having that fast emergence in warm soils. So when we're taking a look at seeding that canola down, maybe it isn't going to be that first crop that you're going to put into the ground, especially if those soils are cold, because you want that to jump up and get to that four leaf stage as quick as possible. Now, that is probably a little bit contrary to some other management strategies where you want to seed earlier to get your longer growing window. And that could also have yield implications. So it's also finding that balance and also assessing your risk on where that, what's going to be your yield, Robert. Is it actually the length of your growing season or is it that intense flea beetle pressure? And of course, that falls into what's you're actually putting onto that seed. So there is quite a bit that actually goes into that little blue seed uh, from, a, from a seed treatment standpoint. And, you know, from Tyler Wist at AFC Saskatoon, uh, in some of their plot trials, you know, they had uh, essentially a base seed treatment, this helix on the left side, that plot. And then on the right side, they had an untreated seed. And we can see that untreated seed was just decimated by, that, um, by those flea beetles, particularly in this place near Saskatoon. Now, there is something to be said about, you know, we're talking about preferential feeding where um, flea beetles will release an attractant to bring other flea beetles into a plot, or that there are um, other chemicals that are released by plants as they get wounded. So these kind of factors play into a sense when we're taking a look at this kind of data. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to pull some yield off of that untreated seed, but the point really stands that treated seed really does go a long ways for that. Now the other part of that conversation is, do you look at having a base seed treatment or are you taking a look at potentially getting an upgraded seed treatment if it's available for your cultivar? And in many cases, probably having an upgraded seed treatment is going to really help. We saw over this past growing season, there are many cases where the, the difference between, say, a base seed treatment and an upgraded one was night and day, actually. And when I say night and day, you know, it could maybe only be two or three days of um, difference in growth, 
But when you get to the end of the season, that can make a world of difference in terms of yield as well as um, timing of maturity. However, there is probably one other key thing that you want to consider, and this kind of ties back to the point about getting into those warm soils and getting that canola germinated and established quickly, is that nothing lasts forever. These seed treatments are usually only effective three to four weeks after seeding. Not when the plant actually pops out, but actually when it's being seeded, because then it's actually in this environment where it starts to become degraded or start to lose its effectiveness. So it kind of goes to the back to this point where if we can get seeding done very effectively, that's going to help us along further down the line in terms of managing flea beetles. Okay, so I spent a number of minutes there talking about flea beetles, but you know, my specialty is Sclerotinia stem rot, so I love talking about that. And in many cases, it is our top yield robber, and this is on a historical basis. If we're taking a look at you know, the overall loss in production across the prairies, it is Sclerotinia that you guys really want to be on the lookout for. So what I mean on a historical basis, we're taking a look at the three prairie provinces here in this chart. And Manitoba, where we are right now, is in blue. And if we take a look at 2010, that's when we saw, you know, a third, almost, let's see, 31% incidence rate. So 31 out of 100 plants was actually infected by sclerotinia. And using the research that we know, essentially for every percent increase in infection or every plant that's infected in a field, that's a half a percent yield loss. So back in 2010, we probably saw on average a 15.5% yield loss uh, across the board in Manitoba there. And if we were to take that across, you know, the few million acres here, that's, that's significant, right? Luckily, it is something within our control. The other thing, too, we're taking a look in, say, the most recent years, you know, 2019, 2021, 2022, 2023, the incidence of sclerotinia has definitely gone down because we've had a little bit more of a dry bias, especially in that critical period of time um, where sclerotinia really likes to take off. There we go. And of course, you know, with a plant pathology background, we have to bring up the plant disease triangle. And you need those three components to cause yield loss, that presence of the pathogen, susceptible host. But most importantly, when it comes to sclerotinia, it's that favorable environment. We see that the rate of infection, the severity of infection is really driven by the conditions at uh, that start of infection, all the way carrying through um, inside that uh, field. So when we take a look at you know, what increases our risk for sclerotinia infection, I, I can kind of break it down into three main parts. We have our environmental factors, so that's what your rainfall is, which then helps dictate your soil moisture, the canopy humidity. So there is a relation between, say, your canopy humidity and the in overall environmental humidity. If we have, say, an environmental humidity of above 80% for more than 21 hours per each day, uh, I think that was based off of some recent research out of, in Alberta. That makes, oh, that's not my video. There we go. Um, if we have sustained humid conditions in that canopy, that's excellent conditions to actually have that sclerotinia kind of grow and thrive. Other things? things that we can also somewhat control is that those agronomic factors, so that dense plant stance. When you think about if you have all your plants close together, you're really creating those kind of favorable conditions in terms of, you know, as it relates back to humidity inside that canopy. It keeps things nice and wet and moist. So if you're actually walking through your plants and you're getting your wet pants, likely you're going to have a pretty increased risk for sclerotinia. Other thing too is your crop rotation. So not only canola, but soybeans, sunflowers, potatoes, all these can get infected by sclerotinia. It's a generalist. And so depending on how your rotation is, if you're having high infection, you're going to be returning these little sclerotia bodies that hide inside the stubble back to the soil. And that's your causal agent for future years. So if you spread out your rotation a bit, you're going to be reducing the amount of inoculum in your soil. Thus, then if you do have some rate of infection, it's going to be reduced a little bit. And then the last thing is the pathogen factor. So the presence of apothecia, sclerotia, and also that rate of infected petals. So when we're taking a look at the presence of apothecia, that's that kind of little circular thing popping out of a cut uh, sclerotia there. And so these can be a little tough to find, especially you know, when we take a look at the upper photo there. They're just a little, little thing right at the base of a canola plant. But that is essentially your canary in the coal mine when it comes to sclerotinia. If you have those, those are going to be the things that are releasing the spores up into the air 
and then those are what's going to infect the petals. The petals rain down onto your canola plants, and then the infection continues. So here's some of the good news. We do have lots of registered fungicides available <laughs> across the prairies to manage sclerotinia, and this is just what we've uh, been able to put on in 2023 on a canola encyclopedia. And what's really great is that all these are very effective for that, and we really don't have any evidence currently that any of these um, uh, fungicides are actually going to, say, be lost in terms of resistance. But there is current research ongoing to test that, especially as it comes back into um, say, samples collected from 2020-10, they're going to compare it, and then we'll see if any resistance changes. So luckily, we do have a lot of options, but really the question is, is that is spraying those fungicides actually economical? And so what I want to do is just kind of go through a really quick case study here just to see if it actually does pay to spray. So we're going to make some assumptions here. Say, oh, there's that video again. Anyways, um, 45 bushels <laughs> canola yield. <laughs> Okay, 45 bushel canola yield, hopefully that's what we're predicting. And then maybe the price of canola is about 13 bucks a bushel, and the cost total of a fungicide application is about 30 bucks an acre. So the cost of that application is equivalent to about 2.3 bushels, and that represents about 5.1% of your predicted yield. Now, if you remember back on that chart, essentially for every half a percent in yield, this just keeps advancing, okay. For every half a percent, that's equivalent to essentially double in the infection. So that would be 10.2% sclerotinia infection rate across your fields. So that would be just over one in 10 plants have to be infected. Now, we can't really predict that, but hopefully, you know, assessing all these different factors, we can kind of make an educated assumption at spraying time whether we should actually apply or not. So for the Canola Council's perspective on this, you know, providing this information, educating on all these different risk factors that play into this decision. Uh, we're planning to release a sclerotinia risk calculator on our canola calculator website. And so taking a look at essentially a lot of the factors that we've already been talking about, I think we have about six of them, you'll add them up to a certain amount of risk points, and then if you reach that threshold, you'll actually figure out that um, you probably should have to spray. And then of course, we can take a look at the economic calculator portion where we can actually input all these values on a, say, per field basis to actually see if you're actually going to get a positive ROI. So that kind of encompasses what I'd like to talk about with sclerotinia. I think that wraps up at a pretty decent time. But now I'm going to pass it over to Courtney to talk about some other big issues in canola. OK, thanks, Chris. So I'm going to be staying on the same path as Chris, um, talking about pathogens that are causing a little bit of an issue here in Manitoba. Um, I'm going to be talking about verticillium and black leg, black leg which are very quickly um, giving sclerotinia a run for its money when it comes to our biggest yield robbers. So my slide says verticillium stripe is moving across the prairies. Not entirely true. I would say that the intensity of verticillium stripe is um, moving across the prairies. For those of you that don't know, verticillium stripe was found in uh, just south of Winnipeg in 2014. And in 2015, the CFIA did a really comprehensive survey of you know, where verticillium was, what communities it was impacting, and it was found everywhere. It was found in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, Ontario, Quebec. Um, and for the three prairie provinces specifically, they did a minimum of 300 fields. So, and about between Alberta and Manitoba and Saskatchewan, um, we saw anywhere from a 40% to a 60% infection rate. So it just goes to show you that verticillium has been around for longer than we think. It's just starting to pose a bigger issue to us um, because we're starting to notice it more, our conditions are more favorable, and of course the inoculation is spreading. So just to give you a snapshot of Manitoba specifically, in 2018, um, the, the province started to do a more intense and in-depth survey when it came to verticillium. So we can see in 2018, numbers are relatively low, about 8% prevalence in, in fields across Manitoba, but that is very quickly starting to rise. So in 2022, we saw 38% prevalence in the fields that were surveyed, and I think that was about 130 fields. This year in 2023, for that growing season, we do see a little bit of a drop in the numbers. There's a couple of reasons for this. Number one is, we've surveyed less fields this year. 
And two, we surveyed a little bit earlier than we usually do. So for verticillium, we really like to see um, surveying happening really around harvest timing. That's when it's going to show the most, um, the most intensely. If we're going out at 50, 60% seed color change, we're probably still going to find it, but it's not going to be presenting itself the way um, as obviously as, let's say, black legs. So just something to note when it comes to these numbers. That's why we saw a drop this year. So to understand verticillium, we really have to understand its life cycle. So verticillium is a soil-borne disease. That being said, it can also spread by water and wind, which we are learning. So um, the microsclerotia that are produced by the disease are so small that they can just be picked up and plopped into the next field. So this is why we're starting to see a really, um, a really wide spread of infection across Manitoba and into Saskatchewan because those spores can move so easily. So essentially the disease, it starts in the soil, it gets uptaken by the root system of the canola plant, and it blocks off your water conducting tissue, so your xylem. And then of course it starts to produce microsclerotia, and then we start to see symptoms, um, and then you know, we harvest, and then the, the decaying plant material gets worked back into the soil, or it stays in the soil um, until the next time that we're planting canola. So it's really important that to note about the, um, it blocking off the water conducting tissue because that's kind of one of our key symptoms as we, in a couple of the next slides that I'll show you. So what's increasing our risk? Um, number one, our presence of microsclerotia. So with more, uh, with the right weather conditions, with more canola being grown, we're seeing the, we're seeing the presence of microsclerotia spread across Manitoba and into Saskatchewan. Um, not only that, the weather conditions have been right. Um, and why Manitoba? Well, verticillium, it's a very, um, well, it's not very picky when it comes to weather conditions, if I'm being honest. It needs those moist conditions in the spring, which of course you all know we usually have, to germinate in the soil. And then it needs hot, dry conditions around flowering timing, which is of course usually in July, creating the perfect storm for the uptake of the disease. So in addition, additional stresses are also going to increase our risk. Um, verticillium is very much a disease that it's going to take advantage of additional stressors. So in 2022, we saw really high numbers of verticillium, probably because it was a terrible year to grow canola, right? We had people seeding well into June. We had flea beetles not giving canola a fighting chance. And then we had really hot conditions. So it really... It was the perfect storm for verticillium to just creep in there and take advantage of an already stressed plant um, and do what it does best. And of course, tight rotations. Chris spoke to the disease triangle where sclerotinia very much needs um, the right conditions. And that's very much true for verticillium. It's also very much true that keeping a host crop in a field that has high inoculation levels is also really going to um, hinder us when it comes to um, eliminating verticillium, right? So if we're seeing a canola wheat, canola rotation, probably those fields are going to see more verticillium infection than fields that are a three, four year rotation. So that's what's been increasing our risk. When it comes to diagnosing verticillium, verticillium for quite some time has been misdiagnosed for other diseases such as black leg, sclerotinia, most likely, or most commonly black leg, but this is also why it's kind of gotten away from us a little bit in the sense that, you know, we're looking, when we go out to scout for black leg, we're looking at the cross section and we're going to see probably a wedge. Verticillium can present as a starburst. Um, it also can present as the shredding of the stem. Um, half stem senescencing, that's what we see when that water conducting tissue gets blocked off. Um, and then, of course, the presence of microsclerotia. Something that we can differentiate black leg from, micro, uh, from verticillium is microsclerotia are so small, it looks like somebody took a pepper shaker and just shook it all over that canola plant, whereas uh, the pycnidia that we see with, um, with black leg is a little bit bigger, not as big as the sclerotia bodies that you're going to see in sclerotinia, um, but that's a good differentiating factor when it comes to the, to the two diseases. When we're scouting for verticillium, like I said earlier, we really want to be going, you know, after we've swathed 
after we've harvested or right before we're about to harvest, this is when the disease presents itself best. Um, we can still see it at 60% seed color change, but we're really only going to be seeing either that half stem senescencing that you can see in that top picture, or we're going to be seeing a very faint grayish uh, starburst on the root cortex when we go to take um, when we go to take samples in the field. So when it comes to management options, I promise, this is gonna sound a little bit doom and gloom, but I promise you it is not. Um, right now, we're really going back to the basics of agronomy when we're talking about managing verticillium. Um, we need to be increasing our rotation. Like I said, eliminating that, that host crop is gonna be huge in breaking the disease cycle, as well as eliminating our weedy um, hosts. So that's our volunteer canola um, at this time, it's really just canola and wild mustard that are hosts for verticillium. So those are the two that we're concerned about. Um, but eliminating, eliminating them from the field is so important because even if you do have a three, four year rotation, if you have a big, um, a big patch of volunteers in those years, in the years in between the canola crops, we're really not breaking the disease cycle all that much. We're still creating an environment where the disease can breed and continue to inoculate that field. So just really important to stay on top of our weeds. Um, genetic resistance, currently, we don't really have any genetic resistance to combat verticillium. There are a few companies that have started um, having their own rating scales when it comes to verticillium. I encourage everybody to talk to your seed provider when it comes to, um, you know, talking about verticillium, if we know that it's in our field, if we know we've had an issue in the past. Um, but that's something that we want to be working towards as an industry is providing genetic resistance to producers, just like we do when it comes to major resistance genes in black leg and club root hybrids as well. Um, testing is super important to know that you have verticillium in your field. Like I said, it can present itself as other things. It can get mistaken for other things. So if you're ever unsure, you t you're out in the field, you're scouting, you're like, mm, this seems kind of funny. Send it in to the PSI lab in Manitoba or in Winnipeg, and they'll get things tested for you to confirm with a PCR test if you do, in fact, have verticillium in your field or if it is just black leg or if it is sclerotinia. And then you can choose management practices that are best suited. At this time, there's no foliar or seed treatment fungicides available. Um, Again, something that we're hoping to work toward, that we are working towards, is having control options when it comes to verticillium. Um, but something really important to note when it comes to not having any fungicides or seed treatments, please be very aware that there isn't a solution at this time. So if you do see an advertisement of somebody saying, hey, we've got the cure for verticillium, I would proceed with caution. We, we want to make sure that we're using products that are registered, that are, we know for a fact are going to be um, helpful towards verticillium, and at this time, there are none. So just something to keep in mind when it comes to our management. So key, key things here are our rotation and our um, getting control of our weeds. It's going to be huge in, in combating verticillium. So we're going to move into um, black leg. Black leg, of course, is a growing threat across Western Canada. We've seen black leg numbers skyrocket over the last couple of years. And um, this is also due to a lot of environmental factors. So again, to just kind of understand the disease cycle of black leg, a black leg is interesting because it can survive on the residue in the soil uh, for, you know, two plus years. So we're going to talk about rotation again. I'm going to sound probably like a broken record, but that's okay. If it instills in your brains, that's what we want. But those spores are released in the spring, and they can infect your canola crop very, very early. Cotyledons even at that stage. So what we're looking for is there's going to, it can present as lesions on your cotyledons, on your first true, second true leaves, and then as we move into our secondary infection, and then of course, um, it starts to grow up, right? If we're infecting those first couple of leaves, then it's growing up, and that, where the major yield loss is for black leg is in the stem cankering, which is probably the most common symptom when it comes to black leg. So that's what we're looking for when we're scouting at, you know, 60, 70% seed color change. 
Again, what increases our risk? Warm, humid conditions, which, as we all know, usually that's a common theme in Manitoba. We get warm and, and wet springs, um, which is when infection happens, is that seedling time, right? Frequent rain showers, we know that the pycnidia can be splashed onto, um, onto seedlings and, and small canola plants. Um, and of course, the presence of pycnidia. That's what we're looking for too when we're scouting. So if, we've see, if we knew that we've had a problem in the field before, if we you know, still have canola stubble in the field from the last time that we had canola in there, and we can see the pycnidia on the, on the residue, probably gonna be an issue. And then of course, tight rotations, just like every, um, every disease there ever was the tighter rotation of canola that we have, the higher the risk that we have of infection. Scouting is huge when it comes to black leg and scouting, there's several different times that we can scout for black leg. Number one, prior to planting. Really important too, to get out um, after the growing season, look at your canola stubble. Um, is there pycnidia present? Is there not pycnidia present? So that you know for the next time that you're planting canola in that field, um, what your risk levels are. Like I said, you can go out and see if there's any stubble left. Probably not, but if there is, you might be able to see some pycnidia on there. And then in the vegetative stage, so in the cotyledon to two leaf stage, we're gonna be looking for um, lesions on the cotyledons. And, um, and then as we move into the three to six leaf stage, we're also gonna be looking for bigger lesions on the cotyledons, maybe on the stems. Um, and then of course, our, our key timing for, for black leg scouting is gonna be swathing. 60% um, seed color change, you're going out, you're, taking, you're getting on ground level, taking a snip of that canola plant at the root tissue, looking to see what you can see in the root cortex. Is it a black wedge? Is it a starburst pattern? What can we, what can we investigate from there? We're looking for stem cankering right at the base. Um, and as we move up the stem, you will also start to see lesions on the stem. So that's really what we're looking for when we're scouting and scouting timing. Um, as you can see, we've developed a, a disease severity scale. So um, as we move from the zero to five um, scale, there's a percentage of yield loss associated with that, right? So zero, that's a completely clean stem, probably very, very minimal, or zero uh, yield loss from black leg because there's no black leg infection there. At a one, we're probably seeing, you know, 10 to 20% yield loss, and it just keeps getting um, bigger from there. So really important to um, be scouting to know exactly what we're up against. So diagnosing black leg, I've kind of gone over the symptoms uh, very briefly, but we're looking for those lesions that are gonna um, appear on the cotyledons, the stems, the leaves, and occasionally the pods. So you can see in that first picture there, the kind of white little irregularly shaped lesion on the leaf, that's what we're looking for, um, really up until swath timing. They can be perfectly round, they can be irregularly shaped. You'll see they've kind of got black spots in them. Um, they're dotted with pycnidia. That's what we're looking for. Stem canker is also at the, at the base of the stem, like I've already mentioned. Um, and then of course, lesions can occur where damage has already been. Um, something I probably should have mentioned earlier, but didn't, is that the way that black leg infects um, a canola plant is through the stomata and also through um, plant injury. So if you have heavy flea beetle feeding, if you have wind damage, if you have animal feeding injury from equipment, those are all pathways for black leg to get in. So that's also something that's important to note when you're thinking about um, spraying versus not spraying or what your flea beetle infection is and things like that. So how are we managing it? Scout early, always. There's no, there's no time like the present to start scouting. As soon as there's um, plants popping up in that field, if you're out there looking for flea beetles, you can be out there looking for black leg too. Increasing our rotation, um, the Canola Council recommends a one in three rotation when it comes to um, combating disease and trying to break that disease cycle. Again, controlling our weeds. If we're giving the, the pathogen a, a pathway to um, continue to breed in, specific, in those fields, um, we're, really not, um, we're really not breaking the disease cycle. So that's super important. The use of seed treatments and foliar fungicides. We do, in fact, have foliar um, 
fungicides and seed treatments that are available to you if black leg is an issue in your field. When it comes to seed treatments, I encourage you to speak with your agronomists um, to talk about you know, what option is best when it comes to flea beetle management or it comes to black leg management, what's gonna set you up best for success. And then we do have early season fungicides that we, you can go in at that um, you know, two leaf stage to combat um, black leg and just get ahead of it so that it doesn't pose greater threat in the future. Of course, it can't stop the infection that has already happened, but it can um, prevent it from going further and prevent further infection down the road. And then growing resistant cultivars. We have genetic resistance um, with our major and minor resistance genes um, for black legs. So again, very much encourage you to, um, to talk to your seed providers about this you know, what's gonna be the best bang for your buck when it comes to genetics um, and trait stacking in your hybrids. Um, testing, I also very much encourage uh, everybody, if you're not sure exactly what's going on in your field, send off plants samples to get tested. Is it black leg? Is it verticillium? If you send it off to the, PS, the PSI lab in Winnipeg, they have PCR testing, they can tell you what race you have. Now that doesn't always help when not all seed companies release the information of what hybrids are, you know, resistant to what strains, but it does give you a jumping off point and does start a conversation um, when it comes to genetic resistance. And then of course, if we are using those um, resistant cultivars, making sure that we're practicing resistant stewardship and rotating our cultivars to make sure that we're doing our due diligence when it comes to combating genetic resistance, just like we do when it comes to managing our herbicide resistance. Okay, so I've got about five minutes left. We're gonna talk about a couple of dishonorable mentions for 2023. A Couple of things that we saw come up in the field that um, maybe we don't see on a year to year basis that you know, cause some havoc, maybe start some panicking um, that we're here just to set the record straight on. So the first one is powdery mildew. So there were a couple pockets around Manitoba and, and northern Saskatchewan that saw some really heavy powdery mildew infection this year. Um, and I'm here to sit, tell you that there's not a lot of significant yield loss when it comes to powdery mildew. Worst comes to worst, it's really going to gum up your equipment and that's where you're going to see it's going to slow you down. Um, some best management practices are including, uh, you know, avoiding wet and dense crop canopy, canopies and eliminating our volunteer hosts. Um, there's currently no registered um, products for control of powdery, powdery mildew in canola, so there isn't anything that you can spray, but you can sleep easy knowing that there is no significant yield loss when it comes to powdery mildew. So it's just kind of something that we, we're not gonna see all that often, but when we do, it's just go slow if it's starting to gum up your equipment and keep your equipment clean. Sooty mold. We saw quite a bit of sooty mold this year. Sooty mold, it comes from the Alternaria species. So it can sometimes be confused with Alternaria black spot, um, but there is a difference between um, alt, uh, sooty mold and Alternaria black spot. Alternaria black spot you're gonna see probably in July. It's gonna come more as spots on your canola, whereas um, sooty mold is gonna really blacken the, the pods like you can see in that picture. And it's coming late season, and it's coming because we have late season moisture. So this year we had a relatively dry um, year, and then what happened in September and October? We got a lot of rain. So that's why we saw um, a lot of these molds pop up. Um, and that's why they're also they're not alternaria black because they did happen that late in the season. So again, to spray or not to spray, um, the numbers say it's not economical to spray for a couple of reasons. One, the yield loss just isn't um, significant enough to really do any damage. And number two, to have to spray alternaria for sooty mold, you'd have to spray well before you even knew that you had an issue, you, or you knew it was going to be an issue. So just something to keep in mind, don't panic, it looks really ugly, but it really doesn't cause all that much yield loss. And last but certainly not least, crickets. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I could hear crickets every moment of every day, all, all summer this year. Um, and a lot of people did find them feeding in their canola crops. So this, um, 
These photos are from Lethbridge, Alberta. We didn't have any out of Manitoba. But this is, this is a little bit of what we saw in Manitoba this year. Not only could you see them, you could hear them. Um, crickets are generalists. They're not a specific canola pest, but because they're generous, generalists, they will eat anything and everything if they're hungry. So you will find them feeding on canola pods, often just in the headlands. Um, and they also don't pose that much of a significant yield loss. If you're really concerned, you can spray, you can, but we would advise just spraying the headlands um, as that's probably what you're gonna need to, to kind of just kick them to the curb a little bit. So you're probably gonna see them. They've been around for a couple of years feeding in canola, um, but not a lot of significant yield loss. So with that, um, I'm mean, just going to close really quickly, but I'd just like to point everybody's attention to um, some of our resources that we have at the Canola Council. So on our website, we have our Canola Encyclopedia that gives you a one-stop shop to all of, our, uh, all of our resources that are all based off of science and research that's been done in the past. Um, we have our Canola Research Hub where you can go and see any past research that's been done on, on canola in Western Canada, current projects that are ongoing. So if you ever have a question of, hey, I wonder if they're you know, studying this issue for sclerotinia, that's a really good resource to have. We also have our Canola Watch um, emails that go out every week in the summer and once a month in the off season. Highly encourage you guys, if you, don't, if you aren't signed up for them, to sign up for them. We as agronomists, we get together every single week and we discuss the issues that are going on um, from basically BC to the border of Ontario. So it, it tackles solutions that are needed in the moment that week. And then, of course, our Canola Digest um, has a lot of really great articles that come, that come out that tackle, um, that we don't just talk about, but also um, industry members and researchers also are interviewed and have articles in there. So highly encourage you guys to be using these resources. Um, and of course, if you just think, you know what, I'd rather just straight up talk to a person. Um, this is Chris and I's contact information. We're your agronomist from Manitoba, but we do have a whole suite, like Chris said earlier, of agronomists that um, are here to support everybody on specific needs. Um, so all of our, our information is here. We'll be at the booth all week, along with a couple of our other agronomists, uh, but also our information can be found on the Canola Council website. And with that, I only went a, mo a minute over, so I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you.